Number 12, People versus Santino Guerra. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Kelly Labrera of Winston and Strawn for Appellant Santino Guerra. I'd like to reserve uh, two minutes for rebuttal, if that's okay with Your Honors. You have two minutes. Thank you. More than 100 years ago, New York adopted a rule categorically prohibiting trial courts from considering specific violent acts of a complaining witness if they were not known to the defendant, even if the defendant claimed self-defense and the, um, the identity of the initial aggressor was at issue. Counsel, exactly what evidence did trial counsel proffer on this issue? There were four specific violent incidences that had involved the complaining witness in this case. Two of the four were precluded altogether by the trial court. The other two were allowed to, um, to be introduced, but only for purposes what of impeachment. Was, what were they? What were the other two? Uh, he, Mr. Um, Pitt had been, there were four incidents, two of which he was drunk. The other two, it, it, he may have been drunk, but we're not sure. It, one was a gang assault. I'm sorry, I mean, I'm not articulating sure. this question well. So what was the proof that you offered, that the trial counsel offered on those two incidents? The proof that the trial court wanted to offer was that, the, that, he, that Mr. Pitt was the initial aggressor. However- no, I understand that, but so you had two incidents, right? As I understand it, there were YO? Fun there, there were four, and- Let's just talk about the two that- Two were YO, didn't. that's correct. So, and all four were YOs or no? Uh, uh, the last one, it, it's unclear from the record whether it was actually a YO, um, but there were no convictions in, in the case, which I, I think may have do, been due to the fact that these were YOs. So you didn't offer the actual YO itself? No, we like, offered the specific underlying facts. The underlying facts. So it was conduct. You also didn't offer reputational information or, or testimony, right? No, not for purposes of this. It was okay. it, because we were constrained by the Miller rule, um, counsel could only, and this happened in both pretrial and at trial, could only introduce the specific acts for purposes of bias and but impeachment. Nevertheless, I believe you did preserve this argument you're making here. You tried to offer it beyond that, right? Uh, counsel did make that argument several times and was told by the trial court that because of Miller, the court's hands were tied. Right. So, so the, the offer, I'm sorry, it's just so I'm perfectly clear, the offer is the conduct underlying these four incidents. It's the specific violent conduct that was quite similar to what was at bar before the court. Yes, Your Honor. And it was propensity that they were assaultive before, whether I know about it or not, therefore they're more on justification. It should be offered to show that they were violent in this incident. I might put it a little bit differently, Your Honor. I think in, on the issue of initial aggressor, the, the question is, are they relevant in terms of an inference that could be drawn? Did the complaining witness act as he had in the past but on it's, that particular day? It's quite day? complicated, and especially when you have young people involved. Um, there's brain development, there's been scientific evidence offered that certain conduct it should be excused because brain development doesn't uh, happen until age 26. You're talking about a wild person here. It's, it's not as easy, as you say, as to predictability of their conduct on the, in, on the date of the incident in question. It, it, it's certainly up to the discretion of the trial court, which is what we're asking, Your Honor. We're not asking for a categorical rule that that evidence should come in the trial at courts times. now, they allow for credibility on impeachment. And, and here, credibility impeachment was allowed to take place as to this witness, correct? Credibility was allowed to take place only as to the two, not the four incidences, because those, two were deemed to be And the birth. incidents involved were what? Did they not have assaultive? No, they were assaults. Two, two of the four were assaults, but one the court determined to be uh, too prejudicial because it involved a threatened, um, a threatened attack with a knife. But assault was offered. It was out there as to his credibility, as to whether or not he was telling the truth on this particular 
date and time. The jury was instructed happened. that they could only consider that material as to his motive to lie. So let, and me, his ask, bias. let me ask you this: if if the um, if the instruction hadn't been the limiting instruction hadn't been given, that is, the jury was allowed to consider it for the purpose of determining who helping determine who was the initial aggressor. It, is, would the rule you want? allow for the court to say, I'm going to allow two of these in, but not the other two? The rule that we are advocating is a rule that, that leaves the discretion to the trial court. So if the trial court determined, based on all of the circumstances and the evidence, as trial courts often do, that two of the incidences are, are prejudicial and not probative or not sufficiently probative, then that would be something or that the some trial number court of them could do. Are, or some number are cumulative or some are too unrelated to the circumstances involved here. That, those sorts of discretionary decisions your rule would still allow for. We are not advocating to take discretion from the trial court. The Miller rule actually does take discretion from the trial court. We are advocating that the trial court should have the discretion that they have on myriad issues to decide whether, in determining the objective question of initial aggressor, uh, all of the relevant evidence should be admitted or whether some should be excluded or prevented from the jury's consideration. Let's say we agree and we say, okay, in the next case, you can bring an underlying conduct on a YL for this purpose. Um, next case, Defendant also has four YOs. People get to put the conduct in for the same purpose? Again, it would be up to the trial court to determine. No prohibition, though. There's Discretionary no, call no for, prohibition. The defendant's, for, the, for the defendant's history. Well, if, if we're talking about the defendant's history, I don't think it's a goose and gander issue necessarily. I think as the, as the federal prohibition courts. Prohibition or no prohibition on doing it? Trial court discretion, same as for the complaining witness? I think the way that some states have dealt with this is that they have allowed what once the defendant. What are you asking for? We, we are asking for a rule that doesn't necessarily treat on parity the defendant and the uh, complaining witness because the what complaining does that witness mean, though, gets on to go parity? home. parity? What would the effect on the discretion of the trial court be? I think for purposes of whether or not you would, you would say that if, the, um, if there's a, a violent act of the, um, of the complaining witness and a violent act of the defendant would both come in, I think it would be up to the trial court to determine, subject to, again, as we talked about, all of the discretion that the trial court has, but I think there's an added layer with a defendant um, because the defendant is the one who's facing the loss of his liberty. So but that should be factored in as well. Isn't an alleged victim their right to have justice, to be free of assaultive behavior. Aren't you suggesting the, a rule that will result in unworthy victims, possibly? No, I think, that, I think what this would do is essentially put the facts before the jury, provided that the court thought they should be there, so that the jury can determine the objective question as to who struck first. But you're That's what we're talking about. But you're suggesting a heightened standard for admission for history of the defendant, so I don't know how that's a balanced presentation for the jury then. Well, certainly if, um, if the courts chose to go down this road, and, and I should also note that the, what's before the court today, the complaining witness had, a, a violent, had four violent prior um, uh, issues, our client had none. So that's really not a question that's before the court today. But if the court did want to go down the road of considering whether or not to, cons to do as the federal courts do, for example, if the defendant opens the door as to, um, as to conduct, that, that the conduct, uh, his own conduct may come in on a similar issue. I mean, following Judge, I have the same concern, I think, that Judge Garcia has articulated, which is, and maybe it's answered by the door opening issue, but if we're not thinking now that we're trying to decide guilt or innocence, but we're really focused on a very narrow thing, which is who was the first aggressor? And we're going to say, well, you're, you're saying we should allow, essentially, past conduct in the form of propensity evidence to help the jury decide that actually it really was Mr. Pitt, because look at his history. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that if what we're trying to do is, is use propensity evidence to help us solve that very narrow issue, just first aggressor, it really is balanced if you then say, well, but if the def what if it turns out the defendant is much more violent than Mr. Pitt and has a much greater history? We really would be misleading the jury if we said we're going to exclude that. And if you're not saying exclude it, you're saying it would be a higher standard I don't really understand how we or any appellate court could review what that somewhat higher but not exclusionary standard would be in a way that would make this really getting at what the truth is about who attacked first. 
Your Honor, I, I appreciate that. And, and I'm, I'm saying for purposes of where we are today that that, that analysis is not before the court because yeah, there, we had got, no violent history on behalf of, yeah. the, um, of the defendant. However, um, if, if the court were to, um, to, to adopt that approach, I, I'll note that, that Massachusetts has done that, for example, in the adjutant case that we put in our briefs, as does the federal government. So New York would be more aligned with the majority were it to go with that approach as opposed to the categorical approach it has now. Even though your red light is on, if I may just ask this question. I, I'm a little confused because we really are dealing with a narrow issue, and it's only when the defendant is unaware of these actions, right? Correct. If the defendant is aware, this gets in, and the court does a discretionary analysis about what to let in, correct? Per the Miller decision, okay, if so the defendant is So in those is cases, aware. what happens with this hypothetical we're talking about, that the defendant also has a, quite a storied history of violence. I think you're right, Your Honor, and, and in that instance, there is no consideration as to whether you'd also put in the defendant's history, that we, we aren't seeing any um, trepidation on the part of the courts applying the Miller rule as to the impact um, on but Doesn't on that go to a different element? It doesn't go to who was the initial aggressor, right? It goes to the state of mind of the defendant. It, it does go to the state of mind of the defendant, but, but the point is that if you're talking about whether you know, we need to have all of the, the facts before the jury and do we need to have equivalent facts for a defendant and but What would the equivalent aggressor? fact be, the state of mind of the victim? He's not asserting a self-defense. Well, I think, Your Honor, you're illustrating why I don't think that necessarily even in, in the initial aggressor context that the two are, are comparable. I think what you're talking about is when you have a defendant who's on trial, who's facing his loss of liberty, you have an initial, uh, you have a complaining witness who can walk out that very same day um, on, the, on the specific issue of initial aggressor and determining who was the initial aggressor, there is less harm or less potential harm to a, uh, a complaining witness, of course, than there would be to a defendant the under the circumstances. The defendant's state of mind does spill over to initial aggressor, even, even if that's not the way the jurisprudence has developed. The reality is the defendant may act in a certain way based on their knowledge, it, it, that, including being the initial aggressor. That, that's right, Your Honor. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. <coughs> may it please the court, Charles Juan for the respondent. In People v. Miller, this court decided that propensity evidence should not be admitted on the initial aggressor issue. Um, and he, this court explained that the worst man has the right to live the same as the best, and no one may attack another because his reputation is bad. And this court also expressed concern that a jury find a homicide justifiable for the wrong reason, i.e. that the disease was unworthy of life. Basically, this court expressed concern that the jury would be misled in their search for the truth. Is it, this uh, rule that is being offered, is it a workable one? In other words, should New York just change because others are doing things differently? And I'll compound the question. Are they consistently all doing something the same, which is uh, the opposite of what New York is doing? First, as to the other jurisdictions, there's a mix in how they handle this mm -hmm. issue, Your Honor. For example, federal rules only allow character or trait evidence. They do not allow actual specific instances of prior bad acts, um, whereas Massachusetts does allow, um, it excludes character evidence only allows prior bad acts. But everybody other than Maine, my understanding is allows one or the other or both. Is that right? And us, and New York. I believe so, Your Honor. But it should be noted that Allowing propensity evidence, even if it is both as to the victim and the defendant, it misleads the jury. It takes them away from searching for the truth and deciding what happened here based solely upon the facts of the case, based upon what the witnesses testify as to what happened. Well, then it, why do we have a Molyneux uh, exceptions? Molyneux exceptions do not go through propensity. There's a specific exceptions as to, and the no. jury is instructed that the evidence comes in for the specific reason that the court decided. They're explicitly told it is not for propensity. But well, but one of them, I mean, the jury is told that, but one of them, one of the exceptions is that the circumstances of the prior acts are so similar that this probably is the person. That seems like propensity evidence. You can call it what you want. No, Your Honor, it has to, that is to establish a modus operandi. There has to be very specific uh, 
details to show that it actually is the same. Well, what if Mr. Pitt has a regular history of beating, getting drunk on St. Patrick's Day and beating people up, and he's done that 10 years in a row? I, think, I believe, Your Honor, that's, that, that there will solely be a, a propensity evidence. That is not a modus operandi evidence. Um, there's no evidence that in those past instances... What if he uses the shamrock to beat people up on St. Patrick's Day? But that is not what happened here, Your Honor. Yeah, I if, understand that. <laughs> if, we hope if, if Mr. Pitt had acted the same way, always used a beer bottle in the middle of a street, where he was hanging out with his friends, then it might be considered as a modus operandi evidence. But in those past instances, he was supposed to have punched the victims in the face. Here, defendants are alleging that Mr. Pitt used a beer bottle. It is not the, um, that is not the same. It, does not, it would not well, fit on why, their model. Why doesn't that assumption. go to your adversary's argument that that's for the judge to determine whether or not it's really probative or more prejudicial? Mm -hmm. why, why isn't that just a determination about whether or not that, that proffered evidence gets to the jury rather than a per se rule that it never goes in? Well, it's for the same reason that we have Malin or Sandoval rulings. This court has held that propensity evidence is just too prejudicial. It misleads the jury. And well, it is too not prejudicial in the face of the uh, presumption of innocence and the uh, high burden of proof placed on the people. But, but what is the prejudice to the complainant who doesn't have either of those protections? Well, you know, it's the concern that is present Miller that the victim should not be basically, that the jury should not decide, well, a victim has a bad history. He's a violent person, so he must have. So of course you, you, could give a, you could give a cautionary instruction to the jury to the effect of the statement you read right at the beginning of your argument, right? Well, that if, is, it's the same reason that... This is not being admitted for the purpose of demonstrating that Mr. X is a bad person and everybody deserves the right to be treated equally under the law. However, for, because there's a dispute about who was the initial aggressor here, you're entitled to consider his prior behavior and the defendant's prior criminal behavior, if that becomes an issue, if there's evidence of it, in determining the narrow issue of who was the initial aggressor. Well, who is that prejudice? Why isn't that an attempt to find out the truth? Because then the jury's not deciding what happened in this case. They'll just be considering who has a worse history, who is more violent, who is more prone to have acted out in this case, not is necessarily listening to Is there any evidence the, as to how allowing a practice where you treat uh, a witness in a manner such that all of this evidence is allowed, how it impacts their willingness to cooperate with prosecution? Does it promote the, the, the truth or justice if witnesses don't come forth? Is there any evidence as to their willingness to see a case through? Well, I guess it could be argued that um, that's, that's the reason for the, the, uh, the rape shield law where in such cases, the victim's prior history does not come in because for that... Um, the it's had a chilling effect on the ability to seek justice in those particular instances. Yes, yeah, Your Honor. And the same thing would happen here. In yeah, but, the, but the reality is here that the judge let, let them question about two of them. Not, not to the full extent, and certainly there were instructions that it could not be used for purposes of determining who's the initial aggressor. But but the victim still has to face that kind of questioning, and did. Well, they came in for credibility. So, I mean, here... I mean, any witness is subject to that kind of potential, right? Questioning. The judge is going to rule. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, the courts do have the, the discretion. And in here, the trial court did exercise it in deciding that certain evidence can come in and instruct the jury that they're only coming in for credibility, to see whether the victim has a motive to lie, based on the fact that he was on probation at the time. And isn't that what counsel is asking for here? A rule that allows certain evidence to come in with an appropriate instruction. I think Judge Wilson put one out there that it should only be considered for the purpose of uh, who started, who was the initial aggressor in the case. And that, you know, you shouldn't imply that some character flaw as a result of that evidence. Why doesn't it work the same way just because it's a different purpose for admitting the evidence? Because this court has always, always held that propensity evidence is not is very misleading. That, that is one the defense wants here. They don't want it to just come in just to assess credibility, which they already had, was given the right to, and that they do have. Well, propensity they, evidence is used all the time in civil litigation, right? I mean, if you're proving a disparate impact case in an employment discrimination case, you're using propensity evidence. 
but it has well, always it's really been only it's really only in the criminal realm, and then again, really only in the realm where the propensity evidence is being used to convict a defendant that we have this anathema. No, there may be honor, but I mean, in criminal cases, propensity is very prejudicial to the defendant. Yes, Your Honor, but I mean, the, the rule the defense is advocating is that, and most other jurisdictions have, is that if propensity does come into the victim, because it is so prejudicial, then the government should be allowed to counter with similar proof. In that case- I guess the point is there's no constitutional protection for a victim. The constitutional protections are to the defendant. But defendant, the constitutional right to present defense here was protected. The court allowed the, the uh, prior incidents to come in to impeach the witness's credibility. It's not, this is not a, a case where- but, uh, Unless I misunderstood the instructions, but specifically instructed that it could not be considered. Uh, my misunderstanding the record could not be considered for the very purpose that the defendant claims is so critical to their defense. That's because this court has always held that the propensity evidence is not, is very misleading, is too prejudicial, it does not allow for the jury to uh, consider the facts. It okay. basically is not helpful to us to searching for the truth. Uh, Except when the defendant knows about it. Yeah, sure. But when the defendant knows about it, because then it goes to his subject, is a uh, subjective, what he was thinking but at the time, so it's right, quite different. It's like they say, once, once it's rung, you can't unring that bell, right? Well, I mean, in those cases, there's a different instance. It goes to whether the victim, mm -hmm. I mean, sorry, the like defendant believe he had to defend himself in those cases. So it is for a different reason. So- um, And they have acted as the initial aggressor as a consequence, yes? Yes, Your Honor, because on the New York, if you truly believe that the victim is about to, I mean, the, the other side is about to attack you, you are allowed to act first. If, that, if, you're subject, if you do have a reasonable subjective belief. Mm -hmm. uh, if there are no further questions, people request an affirmance. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. I just wanted to uh, So raise. under what, what category of uh, grounds for not following stare decisis do you think the Miller Rule falls under, your challenge falls under? Uh, our challenge as to the stare decisis has to do um, with the Rock case um, mm -hmm. and, and the fact that the defendant here was not permitted to um, present a full defense on an arbitrary basis and that the entirety of the evidence that could have been considered in his case was arbitrarily limited. Well, that was true limited. when the rule was adopted. So my question is, what has changed between then and now? We, well, we don't usually overturn something just because there are new people on the bench and, and a majority may not have ruled that way if the case had come to them in the first instance, right? That's absolutely true, Your Honor. It's been nearly 100 years since the Rotowald rule. We've seen um, all but one state decide that this particular rule is not consonant with the judicial system, and for that reason, New York should follow suit. Well, 45 since you? Miller, so that's more recent. Miller is, in fact, more recent. That was 40 years ago, but Miller only considered in, in the context of what the defendant knew. It did not consider this objective question um, of the initial aggressor. Now, the People v. Uh, Petty case talked about threats that had been made against the defendant. And there, this court held that it didn't matter if the defendant knew or not. It based, what mattered was that the complaining witness had made the threat because he would therefore have, um, there could be an inference drawn that he would act accordingly on that date. So what the defendant knew in that case was not relevant to this court. Should we be concerned at all about the implications of a rule like this in cases like domestic violence cases, for example? I think, Your Honor, again, that we're not talking about a blanket rule. We're talking about a, uh, allowing the trial courts to have discretion. So a trial court would, of course, be sensitive to issues um, at, that, that you've identified in addition to issues concerning youthful offenders. But, um, I'm sorry. In, sorry, go ahead. In Petty in 06, didn't we reaffirm Miller specifically? It, it, Petty talked about Miller. Well, I'm, I'll quote it. With respect to the initial aggressor issue, we first affirm that Stokes and Miller remain good law. Correct. But then it went, it, what it said was that threats did not need to be known by the defendant. But that's um, a pretty strong defendant. statement, right? It remains good law. Well, I, I think, I mean, from our purposes, I don't think in the, in the instance where a, um, where a defendant has knowledge 
of the specific acts, I don't think that Miller is bad law. I think what we're talking about is a separate issue, which is the initial aggressor issue. And that's something that I think is more in line with something like the Perry analysis, where it doesn't matter the what the defendant that knew. The sentence is with respect to the initial aggressor issue. Pardon me? The first clause of the sentence I just read is, with respect to the initial aggressor issue, Miller remains good law. That's and, and, what we said. And I think it is good law when, when someone is, as they were in Miller, um, making a defense based on what they knew. We're talking about a situation where the defendant doesn't know. It's something more akin to the Robert S. case that we cited, where there was a vigorous defense. So are you saying this would not be an overruling of, of Miller? I think, I think it would be an expansion of Miller, but not quite an overruling, because if you do, if a defendant does have specific knowledge, then the Miller rule is right on point. What we're talking about is if a defendant doesn't have specific knowledge, and that was not what was presented in Miller. Thank you.